I grew up in a, you know, a suburban area of New York, and I guess I was, uh, I thought I was going to grow up to be a professional something, or maybe a, um, a doctor, dentist, lawyer deal, you know. At one point, somebody even had the audacity to suggest maybe I was going to be a minister, you know. But that was, you know, I, I went to church by, uh, you know, I was sent to church, an Episcopal church, and uh, that minister bit rolled around a bit. But I, I was expected to be a professional of some sort. In, in the school in the 50s, when I, there were the jocks, the teacher's pets, the, uh, you know, the, the intellects that kept to themselves, but you could tell they always had the ruler and the, you know, six mechanical pencils and, uh, you know, those guys. And then there were the rest of us. And I was definitely in the rest of us, but I could interact with all the groups. I played sports. I maintained, as long as I was in school, I maintained some grades, but I, I wasn't too good with attendance. And uh, I don't think I was ever in the teacher's pet division. I guess you were allowed certain, th certain thoughts. When you were in grade school, you know, you thought about first base, which was kissing. And uh, second base was, you know, maybe grabbing outside the sweater. And then, uh, you know, you moved down as your hand was moving from... Uh, the upper thoracic region to the lower thoracic region, you were heading towards third base, and of course the ultimate quest, which we hardly even talked about in grade school, was uh, a home run, and uh, that was, uh, I, I certainly didn't attain it in the 50s. But, uh, you know, and the girls probably didn't even verbalize those things at that point in time. It was, it was too, too much of a taboo. If they talked about it, it was only with their best friend, and, uh, they wore a lot of protection. If you went out with a woman or a girl in, in the 50s, she had on a sweater, a blouse, a bra, six pins you had to go through. Maybe uh, you had to knock her glasses off or something like that. It was a long process, and usually you had to be home by the time you could finish it. We used to have these air drills that would happen in the car. It would come over the radio. Everybody would pull over. You'd, uh, you'd get down underneath the dashboard, and this was, of course, this is a drill. It would be coming over the, the radio, you know, but you were probably being prepared for uh, a bunch of MiGs to come in and strafe your neighborhood. And uh, we were very aware of communism. They were a big threat. The Korean War was fresh in our minds, and, uh, you know, the, the, they were a big threat. The communists, the big bears were out there. Dean Moriarty, you know, I mean, he, that's the main character in On the Road. And we, a friend of mine hit the road right after high school in a uh, brand new 65 Volkswagen, I think it was. And one of the first things out of his mouth as we're driving down the Pennsylvania Turnpike is we're balling that jack. And that comes right out of, you know, that comes right out of on the road. And we, we were so high. We were going, we were heading to Dayton, Ohio. But I mean, at the time, that doesn't mean anything, you know. But we were so high. We're going down the road and then somebody sideswiped us and, you know, just about demolished the car. But we hopped out, you know, took a couple of belts or something and, and tied the, the door to the thing and kept on going. Went to Dayton, Ohio, to Cleveland. We ended up in Lake George for the summer. It felt exhilarating, and it still does to me. I mean, I'm taking off in a couple of weeks for the Dominican Republic for a month, and I still, I have those, uh, you, know, you know, I've got dancing shoes when it comes to going. But we'd be on the road as kids, and this is, well, this was in the 60s, like 64, I guess. We, were, we went to see some girls, which generally you were going someplace that there was a woman at the end of it. But we'd go down to, we, that particular trip, we went down to Dayton, Ohio, couldn't get any work there, went to Cleveland, we're heading to Lake George, and we bogged down in Buffalo without any money. So we knew some people there. We rang them up. You know, we were in the bars. We were down at the park in Buffalo. I don't know the name of the park, but I remember the name of the funeral home. It was Lynette's Funeral Home. And the next morning, they needed some pallbearers, and they were paying. So we borrowed some suits. It's the middle of early July. It's hotter than hell. We've got these uh, three-piece herringbone suits on. You know, we're swimming in our sweat. And uh, the guy paid us six bucks each to, you know, carry this. It was a gray nun. We buried a gray nun. And we, you know, carried her up to where they put her in the hole. And they gave us our six bucks. That was enough to get us 12 bucks to get us in our Volkswagen to Lake George. And we got a job there as uh, bus boys. We worked three shifts a, three shifts a day and uh, spent the night in various places. We, we rented a front porch for a while. We, we slept in a car for a while. It was a wonderful time for a couple of teenage guys. And this, and this was our embodiment of Jack Kerouac, you know. I have children that are that age now, and we're, we're like friends. My parents were like somebody who was, you know, they, they ran the show. I reported for duty, not all the time. But, you know, nowadays my son and I do things together that 
my parents and I never thought of doing. And we communicated with each other, you know, and there was a great lack of communication with my parents. It was uh, more direction. We used to take the train down to uh, 125th Street Station, get off there, and cop. I can't even remember. We'd get like a, a matchbox full of pot for five bucks. What a ripoff. Now I think because you get a kilo for 80 bucks then, you know. But we'd get a little bit, we'd roll it up and get real scared, you know, and uh, get on the train. And then we go between the cars and smoke the pot, right? I guess this one time we got some really good shit and we're out there smoking it. Went back in, man. It was like, you know, we were on the moon. You know, all these people all were just like, we were laughing like crazy, you know. And of course, in those days, we're talking 60, 61, nobody has a clue as to why you're, you're giggling your ass off in this train, you know. And people are like giving a look around and a thing like this, you know. That was the first time I remember, you know, being different from pot. I guess because it was in a public situation. It was, you know, it was, it was a friendly business. Nobody, you know, nobody was out to hurt anybody. I can remember going to New York, picking up uh, four or five kilos at 80 bucks a whack, driving, we had a, I had a, at that time I had a 55 Pontiac station wagon with red leather interior, it was a beautiful car, and uh, we'd drive up to Boston, unload, you know, a certain amount of it up there, then we'd drive to, I was in college in New Hampshire, and we'd go, drive over there and bag up smaller amounts, and uh, I, I made a nice, you know, a nice living in college by doing that. Did you think you were doing some kind of a service? Was this? A oh, definitely. I was helping people out. I was like the American Legion, uh, you know, the, that kind of stuff. It was just another. Uh, it was a, it was a benefit, and I didn't make a lot of money off it. Now, like today, from what I hear, people really suck. You know, they really. Uh, it's a cutthroat business now. If you're if you're in any sort of to make any money out of it. I, did, I wasn't looking for anything to settle down. Communes, I'd come and, you know, I'd visit a commune. So that was not my idea of what I wanted to do. One time I went looking for racetracks. We took off from Santa Fe and drove to Chicago, Arlington Park, stopped there. Drove east to uh, Rockingham Park in Salem, New Hampshire. I hooked on there, got a job as a uh, hot walker and a groom. I moved up to a groom pretty quickly. Went down to Suffolk Downs. Then we drove from Suffolk Downs. We're in a Volkswagen pop-top van. We drove down to New York. Then we went. We stopped at Garden State Park in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Worked there on the track. And then the next big move was to Florida, where there was Tropical Park, Calder Park, Hialeah, and um, Gulfstream. And I worked at all those tracks. And I was trying to become a better handicapper because you know you're always looking for the edge, how to make money without really working. And um, I picked up a lot of tips in handicapping doing that. And I also uh, shoveled a lot of horse shit, but. It was fun. By this point, you weren't talking to your father at all. Oh, I, no, not at all. He, he and I stopped speaking in, when I was in school in about 64. And it, was, it wasn't really, I, he came one time and visited me in uh, Ringe, New Hampshire, and with my grandfather. And I didn't see him again until 1986 in Portland, Maine. Myself, I always had some built-in uh, governor or something that I could just stop before. I mean, I, you know, I did them all. You know, I tried them all, you know, cocaine, heroin, amphetamines, you know, downs, the whole works. But I never would lose myself in, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I went overboard, believe me, but I never got to the point where I couldn't work. Not that that makes it a, the right thing to do, but I, I was never impeded from taking care of, my, care of myself. But I had friends that, you know, thought they were the same way. I had one friend in particular in uh, Coconut Grove, getting back to Coconut Grove, and Coconut Grove was just jammed up with drugs in the late 60s and early 70s. You could get anything you want immediately. And I had two friends that were brothers from Iowa, and they came out and they got into heroin. And uh, the one brother functioned perfectly. He's still functioning to this day, and he's still doing heroin. And he's goes to his job every day. In fact, he was a better worker when he was behind heroin, which a lot of people would, wouldn't find. This guy would build walls out of coral, and he'd have a head full of heroin. But I mean, he was, a, he was, and he, he was not only a good worker, he was a loyal person. He was everything that stereotypical heroin user is not supposed to be. So that's why I've never held to these tenets that, you know, if you're a drug addict, you're not a good person. That's, you know, a crock of shit. His brother, on the other hand, really got behind it. He got into the you know, he dealt it, and he dealt it in a wrong way. And uh, he was, uh, somebody sold him some that had rat poison in it. And uh, he, we, they called up one day, and they told this friend of mine, Chris, uh, 
uh, you, they found your brother in a farmhouse. He's he's gone, and that that you know that kind of stuff hits you in the head. But it didn't stop us from doing anything. Regrets. Let's talk about what from the '60s you would do differently if you think about this a minute. What you would do differently if you had it to do again? Everybody's got those. Things. Well, one regret is that I didn't travel as much as I could have. I was. I thought I was out there all the time going, but looking back, I could have. I could have gone around the world three or four times. And I, it's not really a regret, but if if you can reassess something and look at it as in a more positive way, I would have traveled even more. Now you know I. I probably wouldn't have. Uh, I probably wouldn't have taken some of the jobs I took because they were just so bad. If if I could look back and say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to train rhesus monkeys on behavioral apparatus. I don't want to do that. That's not a you know, that wasn't a good thing to do, and it you know wasn't a fun thing to do. But I thought for a brief time I was going to have a straight job. I should have realized with hair down on my shoulders that I wasn't cut out for this, and it was also, I was still in that 50s mode that this research was really crucial to, uh, you know, the curing of cancer. The guy I worked for was, uh, was working on brain cancer, but I did for 18, 20 months, I did it, and it was just, you know, it was hideous. I had to leave because of that. Um, other regrets from the 60s. I think I, I really don't have too many regrets, to be quite honest. I figure I'm going to have to work until I, I die, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be able to uh, do anything other than probably stay in good health. So probably my retirement will be a, um, a trailer in Florida with a metal detector. Walk up and down the beach and, uh, you know, it'll work. I'm not worried about dying, but I, I, I have slowed down. I played a basketball game this morning and I feel like I'm dead. <laughs>